Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the ACC enrichment session for paper advance audit and assurance. This enrichment session is all about preparing you for your upcoming September exam session. If this is your first time joining the enrichment session, welcome on board. My name is Joanne, the Manager Learning Support for ACCA Malaysia. Together with me this afternoon is our ACC Tutor Guru, Mr. Ben Wilson. Now Ben has, uh, yeah, hello. <laughs> Ben, ben has uh, was experience as an audit examiner and a marker. He has helped students to pass their ACCA papers. Now, before I hand over the floor to Ben, let me run through quickly with you on the housekeeping item here. Yeah? If you have any questions during the session, please use the Zoom control panel chat box at the bottom of the screen and select send to all panelists at attendees so that others can see and benefit from your comments and questions you have. Now feel free to ask any questions you have relating to the subject in the chat box and Ben will actually address your questions live throughout the session. Yeah. Um, okay, I will now pass the session to you, Ben. Over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, so you'll see the screen change shortly. I'm just going to get my screen share. Excellent. Uh, so welcome to this live session this afternoon. I'm saying afternoon, it's it's early morning in the UK. Um, so you're very welcome. Uh, my name is Ben Wilson. Uh, I'm going to be taking you through the rest of today's session. Um, I'd like it to be really participative. Um, so I'd like you to, I'm going to be asking you lots of questions and I want you to give me responses in the chat panel. Um, and if you've got any questions as we're going through the session, then I'd like you to just ask them in the chat panel. Don't don't wait until the end. Um, there will be a session at the end where you can ask any other questions, but please ask things as we go in the chat panel. So I just want to make sure everybody has found the chat okay. Um, so whilst I was doing my uh, preparation for this session today, I posted on LinkedIn that I was, uh, I was running the session for Malaysian students. One of my colleagues told me that if I was doing this session live in Malaysia, I'd have to try eating the Nazi Lemak um, and I've no idea what that is. Um, so can you find the chat panel and tell me what the Nasi Lemak is and should I be trying it? Is it good? Um, absolutely, I should. Okay, thanks, Kotong. What is it? What, why should I be trying it? And am, am I saying it right? Coconut rice, spicy and savoury. Okay, I should be trying it. Um, it's the national dish. I mean, how did I not know that? I've actually been to Malaysia. Um, so I'd, I went on holiday to Kuala Lumpur and I've been to Penang and I'd, I've never tried it. Okay, um, so I should be trying this. Okay, so hopefully, fingers crossed, Joanne's gonna invite me to come out to Malaysia next year and I will be trying the Nasi Lamak for myself. Okay, thank you for the responses. I can see you found where the chat panel is. Uh, let's get going with the, with the session. So, a bit of introduction to me, first of all. Um, so, I started my career working as an auditor at KPMG. So, I've got five or so years of practical audit experience. Um, my audit clients, uh, ones that you might have heard of, the BBC, um, it was one of my big audit clients. Um, so, Broadcasting Corporation in the UK. Um, and I also used to work on the audit of EMI Music, um, which has lots of big name record artists. So I spent five years working as an auditor, so I've got practical experience of what this is like. Um, I then, after training at KPMG, um, I then left and started uh, lecturing. And I've been lecturing for about the last 15 years or so. Um, and I now work as an examiner with the ICAW, um, and so another accountancy institute for the audit exam. So I've got lots of experience of writing exam papers um, and grading exam papers. Um, I've also worked in the past with the ACCA as an exam marker. Um, so I've got lots of experience from that, that side, which I will be bringing to today's session. Um, I also work as a freelance lecturer um, with FME. Um, so it's an online provider uh, where we, we provide a kind of bespoke, personalized one-to-one uh, -one service to prepare students for the ACCA exams. So I've got a lot of experience of, of delivering uh, AAA as a course. Um, I work with the ACCA now as their expert tutor uh, for auditing papers. So anything that you see on the ACCA's website um, or live sessions that the ACCA do for the AAA paper um, will be something that, that I've put together. 
Um, I also do a podcast, um, so you may already subscribe, and I've looked down the list of, um, of names um, of, of the attendees today, and I've already can see that quite a few people already subscribed to my podcast. Um, the reason this is useful, and it is designed to help you to prepare for the AAA exam, um, the reason it's useful for you is that um, I take a current issue each in each edition and then explain it from a AAA perspective. Um, and it's really useful for the case study question that you have to do in the, the, the long question in the exam, because um, it's helping you to build wider analysis skills. Um, and it's also useful for current issues because you know there's generally five marks or so in the AAA paper around current issues. So if you don't subscribe already, I'd recommend that you, you link up to my podcast. Um, and I'm going to put some links in the chat panel at the end for useful things for you. So I'll put, I'll put the, the link for that in the end of the, at the end of the session. So the agenda for today, things we're going to do. Um, we're going to briefly cover the exam requirements. I'm already, I'm assuming that you, um, you've already been studying for AAA. You know what the exam looks like. So we'll do that fairly briefly. Um, we'll then be talking about effective time management in the AAA exam. Critical, absolutely critical. One of the reasons that the pass rate for AAA is so low, it's generally about 32%, it's one of the lowest across the ACCA qualification. One of the reasons is that it is so time pressured, particularly in the long case study question. And so we'll be discussing different techniques you can use to help to keep yourself on track during the exam. We're going to talk about planning your answers. Now, if you haven't planned in the past, you are going to need to for the AAA exam. I find that if students don't get through AAA and they come to me as a resitter, very often the reason they didn't pass is because they didn't plan their answer. The reason you have to do it in AAA is that it's such a big wordy paper that it's very easy to get lost. You need a structured approach to the exam, which is why planning your answer helps so much. So I'm gonna show you how to plan. Uh, we're then gonna talk about how you get the professional skills marks. So those four marks in question one, you've got to bag those marks. Um, they are the easiest four marks on the paper. So we're gonna show you, I'll show you how to do those and we'll have a little exercise around that. We're then going to just go over a few key topics. Now, some of the, 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 the main key topics are things like audit risk. I've actually covered in another ACCA session um, that um, ACCA centrally have put on. Um, so I'm not going to cover the same stuff that I did in that session because I'm going to assume that you've been able to get access to that session. And I will give you the link to that session as well. So you can, you can watch the recording of it if you do want things like audit risk and ethics. So we're going to focus on something different in, in that session, which is other questions, other things that come up in the, the AAA exam. Um, and then there's a little bit of time at the end uh, for Q&A. Um, if you're thinking about breaks, um, the, we've got three hours together today, so I'm, I'm planning to do a couple of short breaks as we go through. So after about an hour, we'll have a five minute break. After another hour or so, we'll have another five, five minute break. OK, um, that's our agenda. So let's get stuck in. So the AAA exam. Uh, what does the exam look like? So like all of the strategic professional exams, um, it starts with a case study. Um, and that 50 mark case study in section A, one big long scenario. Um, generally, you get audit risk coming up for about 25 marks. Um, so audit risk is where, you know, there's, they give you a big scenario. You've got three or four exhibits and there'll be a mixture of narrative information and numbers. Um, and your job in the audit risk question is to pick out the different risks from the scenario, match them up with the numbers to add depth and value. And sometimes you have to actually bring in two or three facts from different parts of the scenario to build an audit risk together, a reason the accounts might be materially misstated. So that's about 25 marks in question one. Um, generally, you get audit procedures in there as well. There'll be something that they're accounting for, um, that they're doing something wrong, and you're asked to audit it. Um, and it's quite practical. You've got to come up with bespoke tests of how they will, um, how, how they can test a particular item. 
This is not like the AA exam where you can just wrote, learn some tests for a certain item. And if receivables comes up, you just write what you have wrote, learn. Wrote learning does not work for AAA. Your audit procedures will have to be bespoke. There will have to be something that is tailored to the particular item they're asking you about. Um, generally, you get ethics coming up in section A as well for about 10 marks. I'm saying C 10 marks because sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's 12. They, they bounce these marks up and down. But that's your typical section A question. And obviously, you've got the four professional skills marks as well, which gets you up to about 50 marks. Um, the 225 mark questions then, that's getting syllabus coverage. So generally, one of them is on reporting. Um, and it will be either, here's an audit report that's been done badly. Can you criticize it and tell me how to improve it? That's the first type of question. Or it gives you little scenarios and says, look, management are doing something dodgy here. They're doing something wrong. Um, what will the impact on the audit report be? And um, so, you know, is it going to be a qualified except for opinion? Um, do we need a key audit matters paragraph? Do we need an emphasis of matter paragraph? All of these different things. So coming up with what the audit reports um, should, should be like. Um, then the second 25 mark question, I mean, the AAA syllabus is pretty big and that second question will cover any of it. Um, the most normal thing that you get um, would be an other engagement. So something like uh, there's been a fraud at the client and we're having to investigate it. Or there has been, um, they're buying another company and we need to do some due diligence. Uh, those are typical topics that we'll get in that other question. But that one's a bit more unpredictable. Um, so the reason this is useful for you to know is you can see on the screen the home banker questions. These are the things you know are going to come up. You are going to get audit risk. You're going to get audit procedures. You're going to get ethics and you're going to get reporting. Those four core topics are definitely coming up. So those are the ones you need to be brilliant at. You've got to practice more questions in those areas because you know they're coming. And then the rest of the syllabus. Well, I would then say just rely on your exam technique skills more. Yeah, depending on how much time you've got to prepare for this exam, you might find that, you know, I haven't got enough time to do absolutely everything. Well, make sure you, you focus on those four core topics and then spend the ba balance of your time on the rest of the syllabus. OK, that's been me talking for quite a while. Um, can you just give me a sign in the chat panel? You're still with me. Give me a yes. Give me an OK. Give me something to let me know you're still here. Excellent. Good, um, good news. Um, that's the boring bit done. Um, excellent, smiley face. No, I'm loving the smiley face, excellent. Um, the boring bit is done. It's gonna get a lot more in, in, in engaging and interactive from here on. Um, so get ready to participate. Um, so we're gonna talk about time management skills now. And um, here's a question for you. What order do you do the questions in? Do you go one, the 50 mark case study question, two, 25 mark question, three, 25 mark question, or do you do it in a different order? So tell me your order in the chat panel. Do you go one, two, three, or do you do something different? Oh, okay, I'm getting a lot of one, two, threes. See why you're a two, three, one. And if you're a one, two, three, we've got any more teeth, two, three, ones or three, two, ones? One, you're a one, two, three. Okay, I'm getting the massive majority as one, two, three. Okay, um, and this showing on screen, this is a trap. And if you're doing one, two, three, I think you're potentially falling for the examiner's trap. So what I mean by that, the first question is massive. There are generally four or five exhibits to read and a huge amount that you can write. It's huge, it's massive. Um, and what happens to lots of students is that they go for that first question first 
and there's so much to read and there is so many audit risks to explain and there are three marks per audit risk if they're fully explained so the students write loads they write loads they write loads and then they look at the time and they've used way more time than they wanted to on the first question and then they get through to question two then they get to question three and they've run out of time and they don't get to the easier marks that are at the end of the exam paper so i can tell you as an examiner every examiner designs exam papers in the same way you put more difficult things at the start more time consuming things at the start and at the end you put some easier marks and only the students with better exam technique get to the easier marks now if you're someone who is going to score 80 percent and you don't struggle for time none of this matters you can do the exam in any order you like it doesn't matter if you are someone who sometimes runs out of time who is on the margins you know you're scoring somewhere between 40 and 60 doing the questions in a different order can really help to boost your overall mark so i'm not telling you you have to do it in a different order i'm just saying have a think about it okay and um, so that's my first big tip and actually if you take only one thing out of this session and that one thing is maybe i do the exam paper in a different order i do the smaller questions first so that i can manage more time more effectively and then come to the big question at the end and use the balance of my time for the big question that would be how i would approach the exam okay and if you remember only one thing out of this session that's probably the best thing i'm going to say okay general time management skills then across this paper so um you get three hours and 15 minutes um, which translates to about 1.8 minutes per mark. Um, now, that leaves you a little bit extra. That gets you to three hours. Um, and then you've got an extra five, 15 minutes. So I would suggest that you're using 10 minutes of that for reading. Um, and that reading time I would use entirely in question one of the exam paper. Um, and that leaves me with five minutes of buffer time. Um, and that buffer time is to cover me for just in case something goes wrong. Um, and it will, you know, there will be something that happens in that exam that throws you off and you end up spending a little bit of extra time. So I leave that five minutes as buffer. And if I do get there with five minutes to spare, I can go back to the big audit risk question and maybe add another risk in. Okay, so showing you how I would do this um, for an exam paper. So this is the exam paper, the exam questions from um, September, December 19. Um, you might have already had a look at these um, on the on, on test reach. Um, so I get to the requirements like this and I, I assign myself how many marks I'm having for each question. So it's 1.8 minutes per mark. So I'm not doing it all with my calculator. I'm just doing a kind of broad uh, uh, assessment of how long I need to spend on each one. So I've got 45 minutes in total for a 25 mark question. Um, so it's broken down like this and I, I am labeling up um, as I'm doing the question. I, and I'm probably doing this in my answer plan. I'm labeling out how long I need to spend or how long I have on each question. So I'm managing my time in question three in two ways. Firstly, I'm looking at the 45 minutes overall for the question. So I've got that in the back of my mind. And then I'm using, I'm looking at each individual question going right. So after 14 minutes, I need to be done with the first question. After the next 11 minutes, I need to be done with the second question. And if I overrun slightly on the first question, so I go for more than 14 minutes, I'm thinking about my 45 minutes overall and trying to squash down the other requirements a little bit. Um, if I find that I am struggling for time here and I'm getting towards my 45 minutes, I'm remembering the advice that very often the last question is the easiest. Um, so if I am running short of time, I'm having a look at that last question and thinking about maybe I do that one earlier. Okay, so I'm doing that for the third question because on this paper, 
I looked at the three questions and went, well, I never do question one, first of all, because that's a recipe for running out of time. And look at question two and three. Oh, I, I like forensics and fraud questions. So I'm going for question three, first of all. Um, and then picking out, I'd go to question two. This one was an audit evidence and audit reporting question. Um, so again, same technique, 45 minutes overall, assigning it uh, per requirement based on the number of marks available. Um, and then doing the same thing, getting myself to the case study question, the first question, which I would advise that you do last so that it's easier for you to manage your time. And exactly the same approach. I'm using my, well here actually, I'm using my reading time first of all, allowing myself 10 minutes to go through the scenario for the first question because it's so long. Um, and actually, just to think about that reading time, I'm never just reading, never. When I'm reading the scenario, I'm typing notes. So I'm active. So I'm making little notes on the things that I read as I am reading through the exhibits. And then allowing myself, um, I've got 100 minutes overall um, for, for this question. Um, and it's broken down, looking at the number of marks available for each part. I'm just timesing each by 1.8. And I would encourage you to be this structured in the exam, um, setting out the number of minutes you have for each question. The reason I like you to be this structured is that it helps you to feel comfortable in the exam. You've got an approach. You have a first thing that you're doing, which is assigning your number of minutes that you're spending on each question. So you're getting into a routine. It's like habit. And so you feel comfortable. And then I think that puts you in a better position to write a decent answer. OK, great. Thank you for the interaction and participation at the start there. Um, we're going to do our next section, which is going to have a lot more interaction, uh, which is all about answer plans. OK, um, so I've already tried to sell the benefits to you of planning. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, can you let me know in the chat panel? Give me a yes or a no. and Be honest. Do you plan your answers at the minute? Excellent, Sabrina, Luna, great. Jenny, you are. Be honest, be honest, be honest. I've got so many yeses. This is amazing. OK. Um, Philzo, you've said scribbling. For AAA, it works even better if you type your plan because then you can just copy and paste it in your answer. Okay, I've got loads of yeses, which is awesome. Um, so I am preaching to the converted here. This is great. Um, for me, having a plan is like having a good shopping list. I'm organized. So if I go shopping with a list, well, I go in and I get the things that I need. And then I go home and I have all the stuff I require. If I go shopping without a list, without a plan, I end up getting distracted by all sorts of other things in the supermarket. Um, and I end up with loads of things I didn't really need in my shopping basket. Um, and I get home and I find that I haven't got the bleach or I haven't got the toilet roll or I haven't got some other essentials that I required. Um, planning is a bit like having a good shopping list. It allows you to be more efficient. So it does take you a little bit of time up front, only a little bit, it takes you a little bit of time up front to come up with your plan, but it allows you to write a much more focused and structured answer that contains the things that you need without all of the waffle. And as a marker of these exams, I can tell you it is so obvious when a student has planned. And the reason you know when they've planned is because their answers are much, much shorter, but they contain a lot more content. They're really focused. Where a student hasn't planned, their answers are longer and they're full of waffle. Things that make it difficult for you to actually mark the, the, the assessment correctly. Um, where a student waffles, 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 it wastes them loads of time and they don't tend to get through the whole exam paper. So I'm loving it that you're already planning because that's you know great, you've already bought into this. Um, so we are going to do a bit of an exercise together um, where we are going to generate an answer plan together. Well, actually, I'm gonna get you to generate an answer plan um, 
and uh, then I'm going to go through that plan uh, with us as a group. Um, so this is going to take a few minutes. Um, I want your answer plan to just have one or two typed words for each point that you're going to be writing up. Um, okay, and here's the question. So you may already have seen this, it's from September, December 19. Um, and this is a really common type of question in AAA, um, evaluating matters which should be considered before accepting an engagement. It, this comes up loads, uh, which is why I've picked this as a, as a question for us to do a plan for together. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes. Um, I want you to go through this whole scenario. Um, actually, in the chat panel before we get going any more on this how many points should there be in your plan for this how many points do we need for this question Ooh. um i'm gonna go i don't agree no everyone's going four to five three to four points okay the the rule in triple a yes afi boom you the man. Um, that eight. The rule in AAA is most questions are one mark per relevant point. Um, and so here I'm looking for eight. So if you can come up with eight, that would be great. Yeah, it's only in certain questions where there's more than one mark available. So the audit risk question tends to have three. Um, the, 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 the audit risk question tends to have three marks per relevant risk. Um, and sometimes some of the other questions have two marks, but generally they're only one mark per question. Okay, um, so I'm going to give you five minutes uh, to come up with a plan. Okay, so we've already had one really useful thing that's come out of this exercise, which is that in AAA, you have to assume one mark per relevant point. Um, otherwise, you're not going to generate enough points. Uh, so normally it's only really in the audit risk question and sometimes in the ethics question where there'll be more than one mark available per point. Okay, so let's go through this scenario together um, and I'll show you how I generate my answer plan. Um, so hopefully this is going to overlap with a lot of the content that you've got here too. So the way I do my plan, I have the test reach. So when I'm using the ACCA practice platform software, I have the exhibit on one side of the screen and I have the briefing notes or the word processor on the other side of the screen. And I'm typing in the word processor as I am reading through the scenario. So the first bit I read here is that this is all about an inventory fraud. Um, and I'm like, oh, is that a consideration around, um, around for me, around whether I, mm, uh, this is probably not my best point, but anyway, um, this fraud, do I want to be associating with a company where there's a load of dodgy stuff going on? It could impact on the reputation of my audit firm if I'm associating with that, for, with, with that company. So I've had that thought about um, fraud and reputation. Um, I'm then going through and going, oh, um, they are not currently a client of my firm. And as soon as I see that, I'm like, yes, great. Whenever they're not a client, I've got a load of things that I can say about whether I should accept or not. Um, the first is I'm going to need to assess my own independence from this business. Um, so have I got um, any, is there any reason why perhaps I shouldn't be doing this work? Um, perhaps one of the audit partners at my firm um, has a personal relationship uh, with someone at Bayerco. Um, am I objective? And another one is, well, I might have some other companies that I work with in this sector, um, which could give me some conflicts of interest. Um, it might not be, it's hard for me to act in the best interests of multiple clients in the same sector because I've got access to confidential information, commercially sensitive information. So I've squeezed two points out of them not currently being a client. Um, they tell me they're in the automotive industry. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, 
or do I have expertise there? Have I got professional competence in that particular sector? Do I have experience of auditing um, these sort of businesses or working with these sort of businesses? Because if I don't, then it might be difficult for me to do this fraud work. Um, next, I'm going through and finding, oh, down here, um, I, they want me to do an investigation to quantify this loss and recommend improvements to the company's internal controls. So I'm thinking there, well, the investigation is going to take staff, people. Have I got the people available to do this work right now? Um, because there's this fraud has happened, they want to design uh, improvements in controls, it's likely they want the work done quite quickly. So I might not have the staff available to do it who have the right experience. Um, down here, this is going to form the basis of an insurance claim. Um, so there's going to be a, I know that this is going to be used for an insurance claim. I therefore, as the, as the assurance provider, owe a duty of care to the insurance company, which increases the risk of the engagement. Um, and there's potentially going to be extra work for me to do uh, to report to the insurance firm. Um, and then uh, they were told, oh, this has been um, reported to the police who will be investigating the matter further. Um, so if I know the police are investigating it as well, and they've got me as a, as a kind of technical expert going in, um, the police, well, they might ask me some questions as well. There's going to be a bit of my own time that's going to be spent dealing with the police, responding to them, um, potentially confidentiality issues around disclosing things with this investigation too. Um, then I'm thinking, um, have I got enough in my answer? Yeah, I probably do. But if I'm thinking I want eight points, I don't like to just have eight points. I like to think of a couple more and then I can write up my best points rather than just the, the ones that I have to write up because I've only got eight. Um, so a nice extra one here, which will always be relevant in an acceptance engagement is how much are they paying me? Is the, order, is the fee for this piece of work, is it enough to justify the amount of work I need to do and to justify the risk of the engagement? So this kind of commerciality point. So if you look here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've got 10 points here for an eight mark answer. Now, when it comes to writing up this answer, I don't have to write all of these. I can pick my best eight. And if I've got spare time, I can write up all 10. But I can pick the ones that I think are most likely to score marks. OK, um, so I'm just going to pause here. I've, sorry, I've realized that my screen sharing was paused all the way through that. <laughs> Oh, technical issues. <laughs> I really shouldn't have paused my screen to start with. Um, apologies. So you would have seen that all appearing um, as, I, as I was talking uh, had I unpaused my screen. So apologies for that. Um, so you can see my answer plan showing on screen here. I'm just going to pause for a minute so you can have a skim down it. Um, so I've got 10 points there in my plan. Um, did anyone come up with anything else? That's not everything you could have written. Are there any other points people came up with? If you did, stick it in the chat panel. We'll have a bit of a chat about it. Just give people a second or so to type. And also, just a minute to kind of read down my answer. So I realized I was not showing it as I went. Timeline, yes, fat in. Okay, now I generally like that, right? Generally, there is there's some sort of pressure to get this work done. Um, so, in, but in this one, it doesn't tell us about a deadline. There is no, there's no deadline mentioned. Um, so I, I, try, I prefer, if I can, to have my risks coming out uh, from the scenario rather than just sort of general. 
Um, but yet, yeah, our timeline works, and I would bring that in around the resources, Fatin. Yeah, so have I got resources available to meet the deadline, whatever it is? It's likely to be tight because they want to improve their systems to prevent more fraud. Okay, thank you, Fatin. Uh, Filza, can we consider, do we have access to the whistleblower? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I, would, I would argue, though, um, Filza, that it would be really, really strange if the company brought us in to investigate a fraud and then didn't allow us to investigate it properly. Because at, at, at talking to the people who uncovered the fraud is a critical part of doing the fraud investigation. Um, so that would be a limitation on sco the scope of the work if they didn't have it filled up. But yes, I think it's a relevant point. I wouldn't have that as my first best point, but it's, it's, it's reasonable. Um, Jason, man, about the fee charges. Yes, I def I've got that one as well. That's my last one. The fees, how much am I getting? Is it commercially worthwhile for me? Uh, balancing up the amount I'm going to get paid with the amount of work I'm going to need to do, the resources, and the amount of risk um, of the engagement because I owe a duty of care to the insurance company. Okay, Jason, awesome. Um, okay, uh, can you, if, so I, I think that's, I, I'm, I'm thinking there's not going to be any more. Oh, okay, Misa, we've got another one. Um, or whether the audit committee has properly reported to the respective party and on the whistleblower's protection. Um, would that score credit? Um, I'm not so sure on that one, Misa. Um, we might be, so I, I think to get a mark for that, Misa, you'd probably more be having to say, um, is it in the public interest uh, for this to be disclosed more widely? Um, so that, that's probably the angle I'd go there. Um, Afi, uh, can we mention we need to consider management's willingness to provide all access to documents? Uh, yes, Afi, but I, I'm not sure it would score here. Okay, in general, that's not a bad point, but there's nothing in the scenario to suggest that we, we won't have access to documents. Um, and they're bringing us in to investigate a fraud. They want our help. So why wouldn't they give us access to the documents? Um, so I, I'm not sure I would, uh, that would score credit, Afi. Um, yeah, okay, um, Nicolette, that, now that's a better one. Um, that's better um, because the, um, the police are investigating the fraud case. They might take evidence away um, and therefore I don't get access to the evidence, so I can't do the work properly. There's going to be a lack of evidence for me, a limitation on the scope of the work. Yes. So the difference between Nicolette's point and Afi's point, I mean, they're, they're both saying the same thing. I can't get the, the documents, but the difference between them is Nicolette's is based on a fact from the scenario. Fact, the police are, using, are investigating. Therefore, they might take the documents. Therefore, I might not be able to access them. That would score a mark. But I like it that you've, the other thing I really like about that is you based it on a fact from the scenario. Um, Jason, why, the, the, why aren't they using their auditor? Um, I don't think that would score you marks. Um, the reason being um, that um, there's really quite strict rules about the non-audit services that a company can get from its audit firm. Um, and um, in the interest of, of getting a kind of robust, high quality audit, actually you don't necessarily want your auditors to be doing lots of other work for you. So Jason, I don't think that would score. Um, yeah, Chi, um, well, our, our work will overlap with the, the police work. I think it will overlap with it. I, I like Nicolette's point that we might not get access to the documents because the police might take them away. That works. But the police are going to be looking for this in case they need to arrest anyone um, for their part of the fraud. Um, so there is definitely going to be some overlap between our work and the police's work. That's guaranteed. Nicolette's point about we might have access to the documents, I think, is the one that would score you credit. OK, loving the interaction. Um, yeah, so, so I, I'm... I'm I'm, so, Sai, I've got that point. 
around I'm going to need to deal with the police. I'm probably going to have to work with them. They're going to ask me questions. It's going to take some of my time. Okay, loving your work. Thank you, everybody, for the interaction. Um, our next session is going to be on writing up your answer. And I follow the same approach in every AAA question. I start with that plan, which you saw mine. It's one or two words. And then having done my plan, I expand out each of those points into a succinct sentence, a brief sentence. I don't write long, long waffly sentences. They're very sharp and to the point. Um, and the reason that my sentences are trying to be short and sharp is that I'm thinking about the most important person in my life when I'm sitting an exam. And that person who is so important is the person who is deciding whether or not I'm going to pass. That person is the marker. And I can tell you, so, my, so, so I want you to humanize the marker. I want you to see the marker as a real person. It is a genuine person who's going to be grading your script. And that person is potentially going to be doing, you know, the ACCA markers will mark something like 400, 500 exams each. Um, and you know, your exam might be the 30th exam they've marked that day. They're potentially bored. Um, and you know they've you and they'll have had to read through some really long answers that are really hard for them to grade because they've got to take in so much information when they get to a script that is short and sharp the marker loves it and if you're putting a smile on the face of the marker and they're deciding you know was your point worth for your audit risk one was it well explained and therefore earning three marks or was it all right and therefore earning one, one and a half, two? There's a bit of judgment for the marker. If they're smiling, they're happy, they like you because you've made their life easy, they're more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt. So I want you to be thinking about the marker and their needs and trying to make their job easy. So things we can do to make the marker's life easy. So we're starting each sentence with something active. Some, a word that means something. I'm never writing, there has been a, or due to the, or in addition to. All of these bits don't mean anything and they, they make it harder to mark. I'm starting with investigate, confidentiality. I'm starting with words that mean something rather than filler. Each of my points I'm explaining briefly. So one or two sentences for each of my points. And I'm trying to keep my sentences reasonably short as well. Um, I, my sentences are maybe 10 to 15 words each. And as you are writing your answer, it's a really good idea to keep referring back to the requirement, just glancing at it yourself to make sure the way you're writing your answer is tailored to the specific requirement. Okay, so bearing that sort of bit of feedback or that, that bit of guidance in mind in the way that you're writing, um, I want you to take this answer plan um, and I want you to write it up. So you're going to recognize this answer plan. Um, here it is. So I'm gonna, I want you to spend, it's going to take you maybe a good five minutes to do this, to write this up using the guidance that I just gave you. Okay, Juan, you negotiated effectively for an extra two minutes, um, but that two minutes uh, is, is up. Uh, so I'm going to share with you my answer. Um, and this answer is written to score one mark per relevant point. If I thought it was two marks per point, I would elaborate more. Um, but I know from my experience, it tends to be one, one mark per relevant point. Um, so... I looked down this and said, it's an eight mark question, so I need eight points. Um, and my first point, uh, the fraud and impact on my reputation, I actually, now I've reflected, go, you know what, I don't think that's a great point. Um, so I'm not going to start off with a weak point. Um, I'm going to leave that one out. 
And if I had time at the end, I might add it at the end, but I'm not going to bother writing that one because I've got more than enough better points um, for me to um, for, for me to write up. The reason I don't like that one so much is because, well, if I work in forensics, my whole job is investigating frauds. So every client I go to is going to impact my reputation by association. So I would never do any work. Um, so I, I, that's why I've, I've decided not to put that one. Um, my new client points, um, so these are written so that it's for one mark per relevant point. So I might not be independent, they could be a related party. Um, there could be conflicts of interest if I work with a rival or a client of this business. It would be hard for me to act in the best interests of both parties. Um, I could have written more here. So not being independent could be a related party. I could give an example like I did when I was describing it to you. Um, you know, one of the partners at my firm um, could have a personal relationship with someone at the client. Um, but, and that, that would give me a, a familiarity threat. Um, but I'm not writing that amount of detail because I know it's only one mark per point. Um, the professional competence point. Um, so I may lack experience of the industry and um, I might be unable to investigate effectively. And then I'm putting in brackets professional competence. That's something I quite like to do in the AAA exam when I'm writing my answers. Is if I've got an extra bit of detail, rather than writing it up fully, I'm just adding as a little note at the end, professional competence. These are really brief points, aren't they? But I'm writing really succinctly so that I can cover everything and get through the exam in the time I have available. You'll see this is a very different style to how the examiner writes. Um, and the reason the examiner writes so much more, the examiner's answers are so much bigger, is because the examiner is not writing their answer under time pressure. You, know, you have to compromise on something in the exam to get through the whole paper. And I would encourage you to write in this brief style so that you cover everything and you get marks for your content. Um, I am trying to write in full sentences, but I'm keeping them as brief as possible. Um, <clears throat> so my next point was about um, lacking the resources to meet any deadlines. Again, look, it's really brief. This is not very good English. You know, this is not going to win me any prizes for the quality of my English. But it is going to allow me to cover lots more content in the time available. My next one, my next two points were about insurance. Um, so I might have some extra reporting uh, requiring some time and expertise from me to meet the requirements of the, uh, the insurance firm. Um, and I've said that there might be a duty of care that I owe to the insurance firm, increasing the risk of the work. So I've got two points in, in, that, in that particular one there. Um, then on to the police. So the police, um, I've got confidentiality, potentially confidentiality issues if I'm required to assist their investigation um, because I have a duty of confidentiality towards my client. Um, and um, a client permission might be needed to, to breach that confidentiality. Um, and then um, my commerciality point, um, my fees need to be high enough to justify the amount of work that is required and the risk of the engagement. Um, I could make that even better at that point, that risk bit down there, by linking it to the duty of care that I owe to the insurance firm. The reason that I haven't because it's only going to be one mark per relevant point, generally. Um, and so no need for me to elaborate more. It would be overdoing it if, if, I, if I did so. OK, uh, I'm just going to pause here for a minute. Any thoughts or questions, um, please post them. OK, Osmond. Um, what I'm showing you here is the minimum you can do. Don't do any lessons, right? This is the absolute most brief amount that you can write. Um, so the question I've been asked from Osmond, I, I realize that everyone can't see it. Um, I'm just gonna put it in the, 
it, when when we're in, um, when we're posting questions, if we can um, if we can put them in the uh, to everyone, then when I'm answering, you can see what the question was. Yes, yes, anal, you can, you can. I'm showing you the minimum. This is the minimum, the most brief you can be. Um, most people will write more than this. Okay, um, don't write any less. But what I'd like you to try to do is keep your answers as brief as possible. Uh, eight marks, Ethan. Eight. Eight. Yep. Um, okay, Izzel, that is a good question. So I've got two points here about my new client. I could have separated them out. I could have done to make it even easier for the marker. But yep. Look how easy this would be to mark. You're so quick to mark. You can read it and understand it so quickly. It's wonderful. Uh, neural, um, better. Yeah, I think because it, yeah, it's full of great content. Maybe it doesn't score eight. Maybe it scores six or seven. The marker might not agree with one or two of my points. I don't know. It's, it's subjective, right? I think this, if I'm marking this, I think it scores out of eight, eight out of eight because I've got a self-review threat. Um, I obviously think it's a great answer because I wrote it. Um, but what I'm trying to show you here is a practical, simple answer that certainly is going to score a strong pass, seven marks maybe, perhaps up to eight. So each one of these is, is one mark per relevant point when I've got seven or eight relevant points here. So to reiterate, I'm showing you the minimum you can do here. Um, if you do slightly more, that's fine. What I don't want you to do is be writing big block paragraphs to explain each of your points. Because if you do that, you run out of time. The other danger of doing that is that if, you're, if that point doesn't score, you've wasted lots of time writing it. You're better to go for short, sharp points. But because I've planned my answer here, it means that I can write in this brief style because it's full of content. Although I've not written many words, it's packed full of content. Look here. So this investigation work, which comes from the scenario, I may lack the resources, e.g. staff, to meet any deadlines. That, there's no wasted words there. It's all muscle. It's all good content rather than waffly long sentences. Fatin, okay, Philza, that's exactly what I was hoping would happen, that you would go, oh, that means I can be more brief in my answer. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, I have to caveat this. If you're going to be the prize winner, so if you're going to score 85 or, or more, um, and win a prize in AAA, you're probably not going to do it using this style. But if your aim is to pass, your aim is to score 60%, 70%, um, then this style is brilliant because it gets over the most common problem in AAA, which is running out of time. Okay, so if we're targeting to pass, this, this is how you do it. This is how you write in this style, it allows you to cover much more content um, and allows you to get through the entire exam paper. Okay, um, the, other, if, if the other point to note to you, there is one mark in the first question, one mark for the clarity of your answer, um, for one of those professional marks. You may lose that if you go too brief and too note for me. So you could be compromising one mark if you if you go for this in, in section A. Um, but for me, it, it allows me to earn lots more marks across the exam paper by um, by 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 sort of not focusing on on getting that one mark. It allows me to make an extra five or six points across the exam paper, which earns me more marks overall. Yeah, absolutely, Nicole. You can be even more brief. You can be even more brief when you're typing. Okay, excellent. Um, so I'm going to leave this answer on screen um, just so you can have a read of it if you want to. Uh, we're going to have a short break here, uh, just five minutes. Um, so it's 1.42 your time. So we'll come back at 13.47. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, after that short break. Uh, with online learning, I think it's really important that you have little breaks 
Um, and actually that works for any type of learning. Short, sharp sessions where, you know, doing an hour, having a little break, doing another hour. It works really well, particularly for a subject like AAA, where it's mentally challenging. You know, you, you're, it's not like a calculation paper where you're just plowing through the numbers and or rote learning. Um, it's a very practical skills based paper, so it lends itself really well to short bursts of study. Um, so we're making good progress. Um, our next section uh, is on professional marks. How do we get those four professional marks? Uh, so actually just give me a yes in the chat panel if you're back and you're with me. You can see and hear me okay. Everything's all right. Excellent. Lots of yeses. Yes. Super. Thank you. Cool. I know I'm not talking to myself like a, 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 a um, yeah, someone who's crazy. Cool. So professional marks. So these are, uh, there are four marks available in question one. Um, and I said at the start, these are the easiest four marks to earn. I always aim to earn three of them. And I am prepared to lose one of them for the kind of clarity of my answer by being brief, because it allows me to cover more content. So I have to, the first professional mark is for getting the right, um, the right format. Uh, so it generally is briefing notes. So I will have a title that says briefing notes. Um, or if it asks me for a report, sometimes it does, I would write report. Um, and I need to write to, so who it's to, and that will be just copied and pasted out of the out of the question. It will be to the audit partner, you know, whatever their name is, who it's from, and that's you know, me, audit manager. Um, and the dates, so you can just write today or whatever date it is that's in the scenario in the question. So we get that's our first mark. Uh, the second mark is for the introduction. So you have to have a short introductory paragraph. Um, you have to have subheadings. So for the audit risk question, I'd be expecting you to have a subheading for each risk. So it might be inventory valuation. It might be capitalization of research costs, um, whatever the audit risk is, a little subtitle, and then um, your points below on that particular point. So I'm expecting you to have in the audit risk question something like six or seven subtitles. Um, and then the last one is for clarity and style. Um, and this is the one that I'm prepared to lose by being too brief because I'm going to earn more marks overall by covering more content. OK, so the one that is dangerous and I think students spend too long on is the introduction one. Uh, so here is the examiner's model answer um, for a past exam paper. So this is the published model answer um, and this is the introduction. Um, so I want to have a read of it, and I'd like you to rewrite it in as few words as possible. And when you're done, I'd like you to tell me how many words you've rewritten it into. So this will take you a couple of minutes to do. Crystal is also on 31 words. Everyone else, how are we getting on? Let me know when you're done. WW, you're on 50. Luna, you're on 40. 40 is good. Got some 45s. We've got a 32 from Izzel. 45 from Shafi. 55 from Laili. Mohammed, 42. Okay, I'm going to show you mine. Um, so, how many is one? I think mine's 33. Um, okay, the examiner's is 105, something like that. Um, I got a bit bored counting, but <laughs> I counted the top row and then times it by five and added a little bit because um, there's five rows. Okay. Now, what is the message I'm trying to give you here? What am I, what's the message here? There's a big learning point here. 
minutes. One. Perfect. It's about the time. This is such a time pressured exam. Okay, Adol, exactly. You need to, in your introduction, right, you need to include the four requirements. Yes, Misa, don't overwrite. Um, the examiner's answers are way too long. They're just not possible to do in the time available. And the danger of starting off with this, spending a long time writing a, a, a flowery introduction, as the examiner has done here. Yes, neural, you do. Yeah, for the introduction, you have to include all the requirements. So I have included the requirements. I've got audit risks, requirement one, a disposal, requirement two, audit procedures over government grants and joint arrangements, requirement three, and ethical issues, requirement four. So I have got all four requirements here, Neural. It does what the introduction needs you to do, but it doesn't waste any time. My, my problem is, right, look at me, I'm old. Right? I didn't grow up in an era where um, we were using these very much. You know, I, I mean, you might not recognize what this is. I grew up when we had to use these things. Um, and so I'm pretty quick at doing this, um, but I am not very fast at this. Um, and so you might be an amazingly fast typer. And if you are, um, it's not a, um, yeah, it, it is neural that works. Copying and pasting helpful, absolutely. And yep, but it needs to be, if they, neural, I'll, I'll caveat that. Um, if they think all you've done is just copy and paste the questions into it, it's not really an introduction. It does need to be tailored slightly. So just a little bit of danger or, of that. But yeah, they can, so copy and pasting is good. But my point is, if don't waste any time on things that aren't that important. This is only one mark. And the examiner has spent 105 words earning one mark. Um, if you multiply that up across the entire exam paper, you need to be writing, what is that? 10,000 words um, if you write an examiner's style, if you're this inefficient at earning marks. You can't afford for it to be like that. So you've got to keep this brief. Um, uh, yes, uh, Fatin, I would write introduction. So it's really obvious to the marker what it is that you're doing. Yep. Okay, any other questions before we move on or give me an okay and all good? All good, okay, crystal clear. Loving it. I mean, it's not just clear, crystal clear. Okay, excellent, Laylee. That's what I was hoping for by making these these kind of interactive exercises. It kind of leads you to your own conclusion. Uh, and oh, ah, Afika, I was hoping somebody would ask that. Um, now, for AAA, uh, you do not have to write a conclusion to earn a professional mark, but. But the examiner always writes in the examiner's comments, better scripts did have a conclusion. Yeah. Stronger students put a conclusion. And th the conclusion is just a short summary statement at the end of your report. Um, so if you have time, Afika, then I would write one. Because it makes you look like a better student. And anything that you can do to convince the marker that you're one of the strong ones means they might give you the benefit of the doubt a little bit more. Um, what I wouldn't do is cut down my content and oh, I've got an extra audit risk to write up, but I haven't got time to write it because I've got to write a conclusion. Do not do that um, because the conclusion is not really worth it. But if you get to the end and you're like, you know what, I've got my five minutes of buffer time, I could sit here and move my arms around and try to distract the other students a little bit um, or get up and go to the toilet just to be really annoying to everybody else. Um, you know, if you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs at the end, then write a conclusion. But otherwise, I wouldn't bother. OK, any other questions before we move on or? We've had plenty of time there. I think we're we're probably good to go. Okay. 
Right, so this next, the, the rest of the, the session, so the rest of this, this section and the, the, the last section we've got, uh, we're going to go through a couple of key topics. Um, so to be um, brilliant, um, it, so actually I'm going to just pause the screen a second because I want to get a couple of links to put in the chat panel. Um, okay, I've put a couple of links in the chat panel because um, I've already run, so I've got, I've, I ran a, a, a general ACCA session. So this was run by ACCA centrally. It went out to all AAA students um, where I covered things like audit risk, um, audit procedures, um, and audit reporting. Um, and I've put the links to two um, sessions in the chat panel there. One of them has already taken place um, where we did a brief introduction to each of these three topic areas. Um, so that's the um, that, that, that one already happened a couple of weeks ago. And there's a second session planned uh, for later in August um, where I'm going to be going through an audit risk question, a full question one, basically. Um, so if you haven't, actually, can you let me know in the chat panel, did, you go, did any of you come to my session, the, the general ACCA one? Give me a yes in the chat panel if you came to it. Yeah, it means that you did. Okay, so you're already familiar with my start. So this has been, um, yeah, the, 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 these have already been promoted. But if you didn't come to them or you weren't aware of them, um, then the links to the two sessions are there. One of them is still yet to happen. Um, so it's, it, hopefully you'll be able to attend it live. Um, so because I did these topic areas in those sessions and you can all access those sessions, um, I'm not doing them here, even though they are the most common things that come up in the exam paper. Um, so what we're going to do in the rest of our time um, is we're going to cover um, due diligence, which is another assignment, um, and we're going to have a think about the other question that might come up um, in the exam paper and the type of things that might be tested there. Um, so other assignments. Um, really common question. And when it comes up, it's at least 10 to 15 marks. Um, it is the basis of a, um, a 25 mark question. So very often it starts with, should we accept this engagement? And then it goes on to, can you help me to do a review of some sort, an assurance engagement. So examples of the types of assurance engagement you might be asked. Um, it could be some sort of due diligence. So we're buying another company or we are being sold um, and we need to do some financial due diligence um, to provide reassurance about the numbers, the financial performance of the business that is being acquired. Um, it might be that we're asked to report on some interim financial statements. So the six monthly financial statements, if it's a UK listed company or the quarterly um, update statements, um, if it's a US listed business. Um, so we don't do a full audit of those. We're just doing a, a review. That's the least common one, by the way, interim. So that's the one I'm leading. If you're saying which ones do I need to really focus on, interim ones come up least often. Forensic accounting, pretty regular. Um, this is where there's been a fraud that's been uncovered at the client um, and your job is to investigate it. Um, and that question we saw earlier where we planned and wrote an answer together, um, that question was part of a bigger fraud question. Um, and forecasts where we are given some cash flow forecasts for the business. Um, it might be that they are uh, looking to raise finance. Um, for their bank um, and the bank has so to, to, to give the bank some reassurance that to, um, to encourage them to lend money to the business, um, the company has prepared some financial forecasts, a forecast statement of profit and loss, a forecast cash flow statement looking into the future. Um, and as the assurance provider, we're asked to give um, some reassurance that the numbers make sense. Um, these questions are extremely scenario based. So this is not an area where you can pre-prepare and rote learn, oh, in a due diligence question, I need to just write this, this and this and it will score me the marks. Never the case. In these questions, you have to respond to the specific information in the scenario. So I'm going to show you me doing that uh, with a past exam question. 
Um, oh, and in general, as across most of the AAA exam, we're going to assume one mark per point. The only place I don't assume that, I'm being totally honest with you, the only place I don't assume that is in audit risk. You know, audit risk, business risk, that area where it's two or three marks per point, everything else I assume is one mark per point. And if they give more than one mark, well, that's a bonus. Um, okay, so my approach to um, an other engagements type question. Um, I go through the scenario and I mine it. I mine it. Um, for facts that I can use to make tailored points. Um, and then if I don't have enough points, I haven't got enough content from the scenario, it's an eight mark question and I've only got six points, I have to come up with something generic. I don't like doing that. I ideally don't do anything generic, but if I have to, I'll come up with, with some generic points. Things like discuss something with management. My plus point there is to say that you don't score marks for just saying discuss something with management. You have to say what it is, and it needs to be something subjective, something where only management know the answer. It can't be something where there's third party evidence. Another general point I might make is I'll get management representations, written management representations, and the plus here is to say, I won't get marks for saying written management representations unless I am specific about what they are, is to confirm a judgmental matter. And I need to say what that judgmental matter is. I like to try to do analytical procedures. So setting an expectation, comparing it to actual and investigating differences. I've put a little plus point here to say, I need to say what this analytical procedure is. Ideally, I'd describe it. And ideally, I'd actually do the analytical procedure if they do give me some numbers. And I'll recalculate anything that, any calculations that management have done. Um, so my plus point here is I need to say exactly what it is that I'm recalculating. So perhaps casting the schedule, making sure it adds up. So just to reiterate, those general points, I'm only going to write those if I haven't got enough bespoke tailored points from the scenario. Ideally, everything is tailored to the scenario, and I, therefore I don't need these general points. Okay, we're going to see this question approach now um, with sept the September 18 exam, uh, question 3A. Um, this exam paper you can get from the practice platform. It's been loaded up in there as practice exam number one. Okay. Here we are in Test Reach, the practice platform software. We're focusing on another assignments question here. This is the September 2018 exam paper, uh, which has been loaded into Test Reach. as practice exam one and we're going to do question 3a so i've already navigated down here to question three and start as always by opening up the requirement and getting my word processor open too and organizing my screen so that i can see both of those but i'm not covering the navigator so i can go backwards and forwards and i can still see the exhibits down here so i can open and close them First step, as always, is to copy and paste the questions into the word processor to form my plan, the structure for my answer. So the first requirement here is I've got to explain, and I've bolded explain because I'm telling to myself I need to fully develop my points, explain the matters that I'd consider before accepting. So this is really a sort of ethics type question, isn't it? Independence, that sort of thing. What should I take into account before I do it? So I'm going to do a bit of ethicsy stuff in there. And I'm also going to do some practical points as well that are coming out of the scenario, hopefully. And then the second question is I need to make um, some recommend some examination procedures to be performed in respect of the forecasts um, of profit and loss. And it's telling me I need to. is exhibit one but i'm going to use my exam technique i know that sometimes 
there is some information contained within the original scenario that can be useful. So is there anything useful in here? And strangely, in this question, there's basically nothing. That is very unusual. But there is nothing in there, but I haven't left it to chance. I've made sure there's nothing in there before I open up the exhibit. Let's focus on the first requirement initially, explaining these matters around acceptance. So let's read through the first paragraph. Is there anything interesting in here? They've been an audit client for the last five years, so I'm already working with them. And they're planning a significant expansion into a new geographical area and jurisdiction. To finance the plan expansion, they need funds to purchase some stuff and they're planning a new advertising campaign. I've been, well, is there anything interesting in here? Well, the fact that they're raising finance, um, yeah, let's get that into our answer. What I'm getting at there is that to, there's going to be some reliance by a third party on this. There's going to be a kind of duty of care. Am I happy to do it? Next paragraph. I've been approached to provide a report on this to support the loan application. Um, so that reliance or duty of care is to the bank for the loan application. And then I'm given a lot of information here around this loan application and some forecasts. It's going to be revenue, cost of sales, admin expenses, profit before tax. Okay, so I've got all of these numbers which I'm definitely going to be using in the second question. What about these notes? Oh, look, this is going to be relevant for part B, isn't it? Um, that the company is forecast to grow, but is that reasonable? Staff costs, admin expenses, and finance costs. This just gives me a bit of an explanation of these numbers. So quite frustratingly and quite unusually for the AAA exam, this first question, there's not much given to me in the scenario that I can run with. So I'm going to need to generate points for my own knowledge and understanding of acceptance. So I like to think of ethical points. They'll often be, um, they'll often be, um, I can make these sort of general ethical points around acceptance. So there could be a self-interest threat from the fees. There could be a self-review threat because I'm the auditor. So if I have um, helped them to, um, to, to, to get this finance um, and they do end up expanding as a result, um, I've got a bit of reviewing of my own support that could happen as a result of the, of the audit. I thought of a further point around that self-interest point on on fees um, could be around the growth of the business too. So I'm going to get fees from this piece of work, and so that gives me a self-interest, um, a, a, a fee dependence, um, and the growth of the business. I'm going to want this to, to be successful so I can earn more work in the future. Now this is six marks, and I haven't got six points yet, so I'm going to try and think of some more practical points too. Uh, what about the staff and resources that I'd need to do the work? That'd be a decent one. I've also got, is this going to be commercially viable? You know, are the fees going to be high enough to justify the amount of work that I've got to do? Have I got experience in doing this sort of work? That's a sort of professional competence point. Lovely. I've got six points there now could go on and plan part the second part of the question and then write them both up but I quite like writing whilst the ideas are fresh in my mind so I'm going to write these up now so this first point which is about raising finance and potentially owing a duty of care to the bank so in fact they're raising finance and reliance is going to be placed on these forecasts by the banks to make a loan decision I'm potentially going to owe a duty of care to that bank, increasing the risk of the engagement. And I'm explaining what I mean by that because the verb is explain. Janssen may be sued if the forecasts turn out to be incorrect. Nice. Right, I picked out two different self-interest threats. Potential fee dependency from the combined audit fee and this uh, the, the fee for this piece of work. And I also picked out a second self-interest threat that I kind of want them to get the loan approved so that the business grows and I earn more fees in later years. 
So there are my two self-interest threats. First one, that the combined fees from the audit work and the forecast could be significant, leading to fee dependency. Janssen may overlook issues to retain the lucrative fees. Nice. And then the second one, I've said again, it's a self-interest threat. The auditor would benefit from higher fees in later years if the loan is approved and the business expands. They may sign off on overly optimistic forecasts without robust challenge to help the loan application to succeed. Objectivity and independence may be compromised as a result. I like putting those words into any ethics answer. Objectivity and independence. I know that they quite often just pick up credit. And I'm writing this amount of detail because the verb is explain. Okay, self-review threat then. This is where the results of this expansion may well uh, be, be reflected in the financial statements uh, in future years. So there's a self-review threat as the results of the forecast and the loan application will be reflected in the financial statements, which is subject to future audit. The auditor may overlook issues, not wanting to draw attention to errors in their original work, or they could lack professional skepticism, accepting their colleagues' work without challenge. Again, I'm writing this amount of detail because the verb is explain. Right, what about these other points then? Staffing and resources. Have I got enough people to do this work, especially considering that this is a significant expansion? So staffing and resources. It's a significant expansion with potential time pressure from the directors of the bank to get the work done. Does the audit firm have sufficient staff available to perform the work to meet the deadline? Next point is commercially viable. And that's basically, is the fee enough to justify the risk and the amount of work that needs to be done? So commercially viable, does the fee justify the work required and the risk of the engagement? I've gone a little bit shorter here. Frankly, there's not a lot more to say. That is an explanation. There's just not a lot more here. Is it high enough, that fee? And the last point was about experience, wasn't it? Have I got professional competence in doing this sort of work? So experience, does the auditor have professional competence in the review of financial forecasts? They could be new to this type of work and may not spot issues or problems with the forecast. Lovely, that's us done for part A, the first bit, and then we'll move on to part two. So the second question where we're asked to recommend the examination procedures to be performed in respect of these forecast statements of profit or loss. So we've got to look at these forecasts and say what we would do to check whether these numbers look correct. And to make this a tailored answer, we need to use the scenario information. So in this first paragraph, there are certain things that are going to be really important for us to comment on that need to be reflected in the numbers. The fact that they're going to buy a load of new vehicles and warehouse facilities. And what would you expect to happen there? Well, if you've got a load more vehicles and warehousing, you'd expect a lot more depreciation. So we'd expect to see that in the numbers. We'll come back to that point. This comment here, the company is planning a major campaign, advertising campaign and marketing. You'd expect to see that reflecting in the numbers too, wouldn't you? Okay. Into the second, so we've not really used anything out of that first paragraph yet, but we will use it when we analyze the numbers. Next paragraph, we're told that there is a new long term loan of 22 million from the current lender. So let, we're going to do some examination around that. What would you want to know about it? Well, you'd want to see things like what are the interest rates on it? because that's going to need to link in with the finance costs. It tells me in the scenario that the company has got a loan of 31 million from the bank, redeemable in five years time. So I'd want to get the documentation for that and see if it is actually redeemable in five years. And I'd want to see if there are any covenants restricting any further finance being raised. Then going into the numbers themselves. Now, 
one of the general things we like to do when we're doing any kind of um, any kind of other assurance engagement is to do analytical procedures calculating percentage changes and seeing if if the the numbers kind of stack up so i'm going to look at things like well what's their revenue growth rate and i'm going to do numbers for that to calculate the growth in revenue and then i'm going to think about what i do to support those numbers so they're forecasting that revenue is going to grow by 26 percent in x6 and by 29 percent through to x7 I'm not showing the workings because these numbers will be marked as right or wrong. So there's no need to show the workings. So how would I say that those numbers look realistic? What would I want to agree that back to? Well, how would management have come up with these as an assumption? Are these assumptions reasonable? And I'd want to compare it to something. What would tell me whether it's a reasonable assumption? Oh, they might have done some market research. It's also worth looking at the note. Note one, which is around revenue down here, tells me that they're expecting they'll, they'll see a growth in both existing and new markets over the next two years. I want to see how much of that revenue is coming from new markets and how much from existing to see if the assumptions look reasonable. What about the cost of sales? They're assuming the cost of sales are going to grow by a bit less than revenue. And look at the note for cost of sales. It includes staff costs, depreciation of all of my new equipment. And so I'd want to make sure that they're including enough for the new staff that are being recruited and the extra depreciation on the things that are being acquired. This note from up here. Excellent. I'm up to four points now out of the nine that I need. What else have I got? Oh, next line. Admin expenses here are forecast to fall. Does that sound realistic as the business grows? It tells me admin expenses are mainly the costs of running the central head office facility. But there must be other things included in there. Maybe this marketing campaign. Then let's look at the finance costs. So the finance costs are forecast to go up in year one and then down in year two. Now I can see why they go up in year one because we've got these extra interest costs on the new loan. Um, seems strange they drop in the year after that. Maybe I'm repaying some of the original loan. But what I'd want to do is make sure that the, the these these interest amounts tie back to the loan documentation. Lovely. So I've now got one, two, three, four, five, six points, and this is out of nine. So I'm going to need to try to come up with a few other general ones from my list. So I've had discussed with management. I've already got that. I can use management representations. I'll use that one. I've already got my analytical procedures, and I can use recalculate. So I'm going to get written management representation over any key assumptions. And I'm going to use recalculate. My recalculation is being making sure it all adds up. So I've got eight points there. This is a nine mark answer, so I prefer to have another one. But I've st I, and something might come to me as I'm writing my answer. But what I'm not going to do is just make up something that is, you know, just to fill the space. I'm confident enough to go, well, I'll go with my eight and I might think of something as I'm typing. So let's write these up. My first point was about the $22 million new loan. I want to obtain the loan documentation and get the interest rates on there. So that 22 million new loan, I'm gonna get the loan documentation and ensure that the interest costs are included in the forecast under the finance cost section. The $31 million loan, I want to get the documentation for that and make sure there's no covenants that restrict any extra finance being awarded. Although saying that it's with the same bank, so that's probably okay, but it's still something I'd want to do. So I'm gonna get the loan documentation for the $31 million loan and review, review it for restrictive covenants. Are they able to raise new debt? Have any covenants over interest cover or anything else been met in the forecasts? Lovely. Next, I'm on to revenue, which they're saying is growing spectacularly. 
are these assumptions reasonable? What I'd want to do is get a breakdown of the new clients versus uh, new markets versus existing. And I'd want to obtain any market research that they've done to support the forecasts. So the revenue growth rate of 26% and then 29% is high. Is that assumed growth rate reasonable? To find out, I'd obtain a breakdown of the forecast by new slash existing markets. And I'd trace the growth rates in each market to external market research. Lovely. Now I've got my cost of sales line which is forecast to grow, but not as much as revenue. So I'm going to make a basic point in here about fixed and variable costs. Presumably some of these costs are fixed because they're not going up by the same amount as revenue is. Um, and my key point is I was told that they're going to be buying new warehousing and taking on new staff. Have these costs been included? So my cost of sales is growth is below revenue. Obtain a breakdown of the cost of sales and ensure that depreciation of the new warehouse and other assets is included and the staff costs are included as well to deliver on the new strategy. And actually that's led me on to another thought. I thought I might think of something as I'm writing this answer. This new warehouse, well, the, the, the depreciation is going to be based on the cost of the new warehouse. So... I want to do something to verify the cost of the new warehouse. Maybe they've got a quote or something to build it. So that new warehouse, I'd want to trace the cost to supplier quotes and recalculate the depreciation. I could go on and say it's in line with the company's policies, but I've already got enough stuff in this answer, I think. Right, onto the admin expenses then, which we said are going to are, are dropping even though there's growth in revenue. Um, have they included the costs of marketing, which they said they're going to have a major campaign? So the admin expenses are, f are far forecast to fall. This is inconsistent with the expansion of the business. I'd want to obtain a breakdown and ensure that the major new advertising and marketing campaign costs are included. I could go one step further and then say for the cost of these campaigns, I'd want to agree it to quotes from the advertising company. But... It's only nine marks this question. I've already got enough in my answer. Um, my next point on the finance costs. Actually, I've already made this point up here at the top, haven't I? So what I'm going to do is just put my finance cost numbers up with that first point. Well, now actually I'm down to only eight points. So perhaps I will trace these marketing campaign costs to supplier quotes. Nice. Good to be flexible in AAA. I like that point particularly and that point because they're so short. Lovely, easy, simple. Okay, this one, I want to get management representations, in fact, written management representations over any key assumptions. And I'm being specific about what those assumptions are. For example, the revenue growth rate. And my recalculation, I'd want to make sure that this schedule adds up. Smashing. And I am done. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, eight, nine points. Lovely. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that was uh, a whistle stop tour of, of that question. Um, You'll have noticed there how flexible and fluid I was when I was going through, particularly writing up the answer. Um, always looking at the number of marks available, thinking about how many points I've got. Do I need more points? And as new things come to me, I'm not afraid to write them. Um, but having gone through that two stage process, number one, planning the answer. Number two, writing it up. It gives me more scope and space to think um, and to perhaps come up with new ideas. It's a really effective approach. Um, I've had a question in the chat panel um, about, uh, do you need to explain the meaning um, of your uh, ethical threats? Um, look at the number of marks available uh, is, is the answer. So um, if there are six marks available, we're looking at six short points. Uh, so I wouldn't over elaborate is, is my answer to that. Um, does anyone have any other questions or thoughts or comments 
um, on that video. Anything you'd like to ask me out of it? Okay, Hanny, um, is it okay if the answer is in question marks? Um, the examiner would say slightly better not to be in question marks. But I find it in these sort of in these sort of requirements. I'm not leaving it as just a question. I am saying about what I'm actually going to do. Um, so better not to have them as questions, but it is okay to do that. Um, Asmin, do we need to include the percentage of increase in the answer? Yes, absolutely you do. Um, I, I noted there when I was doing the, um, in the video, I, I said, I've not shown the calculation. So my revenue growth rates, I can't remember what they were, 26%, 29%. Um, I'm not showing how I've calculated 26 and 29% because there'll be, uh, they'll actually in the marking schemes here, there's generally half a mark for each calculation that you do, but it's only half a mark and therefore it will be graded as right or wrong. Uh, so you don't need to show the working, but yes, absolutely. It's a good idea to, to show the numbers. They gave us the numbers for a reason. We're supposed to use them. Asmin, great question. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on? Ah, okay. Anal, uh, for audit procedures questions. Is it necessary to include analytical procedures, analytical reviews? Um, well, I had in that question there, I did the analytical procedures. So I did the revenue has grown by this amount. Um, I could have done more. So I could have done things like the operating profit margin yeah, or, or the gross profit margin. Those things would have been useful to do. Um, but I, you know, I only needed nine points. A, a good point, actually, and I wanted to sort of build on something you asked there about, is it worth doing analytical procedures? Uh, it is something that the, so the new syllabus is out for, for AAA. So in September 21, you're the first student seeing the new syllabus. The old syllabus and the new syllabus are like 99.9% .9 the same. Um, but the one of the teeny tiny differences in the new syllabus is there is more of an emphasis on analytical procedures. So it's something that I would expect to see quite a lot of in your exam paper. Um, where, they in, where, they, where something is new in the syllabus or beefed up, increased, um, they tend to test it. Uh, and so I would, I would be very ready for analytical procedures to come up because it's something that's new in the syllabus. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Okay, uh, we're going to have another short break here. Um, so we'll have a short break. That's going to take us to. So five hours on. It's uh, we're going to go until um, two thirty nine. Um, so I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Make sure you get away from your computer, go and get yourself a cup of tea or something, uh, be active, move around uh, so that you're fresh and ready for the last session.
Thank you, <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, welcome back after that short break. Uh, I've been asked whether the recording will be given to you. Um, I know the session is being recorded. I can't actually answer that question. I don't know if this is definitely being shared. Um, is uh, I, and I'm not. I think Joe has actually dropped off the call. Um, so I can't tell you 100% whether it's going to be shared. I think it will be. Um, Okay. Thank you. I imagine it will be. I can't see why they wouldn't, but you never know. Um, okay, so our last section, uh, we're going to be looking at, well, two things here. One is these other questions. Um, so the other thing that might come up in the exam paper, I said you've got your core topics of audit risk, audit procedures, ethics and reporting that are four core topics and then something else might come up um, and so we're going to cover what that other thing might be and then there's a little bit of time at the end for a Q&A but people have been asking questions all the way through so I'm, I imagine that Q&A will be quite limited but if you do have any questions at the end I'll, I'll happily take them um okay and so our planned time finish uh, is uh, your time is uh, three thirty, isn't it so we've got about 50 minutes left. Okay, uh, so other questions then, the other things, um, 10 to 15 marks generally, um, and we don't know what it's gonna be. This is the unpredictable bit. Um, and for me, I'm happy if I score half marks here. If you get half marks, wonderful, um, because you've scored so many marks in the more core topic areas because you're so good at ethics. You're so good at reporting because you've practiced so many questions in those areas that getting a few marks here is fine. That's going to be enough to get us up to a pass overall. Um, the reason there is this kind of other part of the exam um, is to allow the ACCA to get uh, syllabus coverage. So yes, they always examine the core topics, but it allows them to, to test the rest of the syllabus. And you just don't know what your, your exam paper is going to have on it, unfortunately. Okay, so the kind of things we tend to see in these, these other questions. Um, one is around acceptance and actually we see that a lot we've seen that in, in some of the stuff we've actually done already today should we take on a, a, an engagement another one is around quality control and actually this is coming up more and more often and so perhaps it's it's one you should, really should be thinking about and um, perhaps practicing some questions in uh, this is where we're given um, an extract from the audit file and we're told you know we're the manager we're coming in to review the audit file um, and we've got to comment on the quality of the work, the sufficiency and appropriateness of the audit evidence, um, and then suggest other things we might need to do to get more audit evidence. Um, so when that quality control stuff comes up, there's quite a big overlap actually with audit procedures because you're given the procedures that someone else has done and then you've got to ask, you're asked to comment on them. So it's a kind of higher level skill. Um, money laundering is something that, you know, doesn't come up every sitting, but reasonably regularly. Um, so there'll be some indicators of money laundering in a scenario, you know, placement, layering, um, and then extraction of the of the money from the financial system. Um, so there'll be some indicators in the scenario that money laundering might be happening and you're asked to comment on them. Um, this actually very often comes up in, in the first cuts question, the case study question, where we are doing a group audit and perhaps we're having to interact um, with the um, subsidiary auditors. Perhaps there's an overseas subsidiary and it is being audited by a different audit firm um, and we're having to kind of comment uh, on, on the relationship with them and perhaps the quality of their work. Um, we might be given an audit strategy so an approach uh, to an audit, um, perhaps from a subsidiary auditor that has, has sent this audit strategy document to us, and we might be asked to comment on the quality of, of that audit strategy. Do we think it's robust? Is there an approach of controls and substantive testing? Um, is, is it appropriate for this client? Um, we might be asked about using an expert. So it could be uh, something like internal audit. 
crypto um, should we be using their work or it might be that you know they're, they're valuing something quite subjective and technical uh, so they've got some property or something that we might need to get a, um, a, a valuation report on um, but it, talking about the the interaction with the expert is something that sometimes comes up um, current issues so um, I mean current issues tend to be things that the ACCA have published on in the technical articles. So the best prep really you can do for current issues is to read those technical articles. Although there are loads and they're, I mean, each technical article is massive. They're, they're huge, so a bit overwhelming. Um, so something that I mentioned earlier is uh, that I, I do is I, I have a free podcast uh, where I discuss current issues from an auditing perspective. And the idea of that is to help you uh, for this element of the exam. Um, my next podcast, I've actually, um, so I'm recording next week, I'm interviewing an audit partner um, from a big four firm, um, so a friend of mine, and we're going to be discussing current issues in auditing um, in that session. Um, I'm just going to pop the um, the link to my podcast in the chat panel. Um, so if you would like to sign up for it, um, it's free. You can get it on Spotify. You can get it on um, Apple as well, Apple Podcasts. Um, it's called Ben Wilson. Oh, so it's called ACCA Ben Wilson Audit Cast. Um, so if you if you can't find it through that link, then just stick that search into your podcast provider. Um, and there's a back catalogue of previous issues, which you'll find interesting as a revision tool. Um, and then the next edition, which is coming out next week, um, is me interviewing an audit partner about current issues. So this will be useful for you. Okay, um, so we're going to look at um, a another demonstration question, um, and this one is um, looking at other questions using the September 18 exam um, and it's question 1c and 1d that we're going to be looking at here. Uh, so hold on, the screen's going to change slightly. Oh, hold on a sec, the screen's going to change again. We are in the practice platform and we are looking at the September 18 exam. Uh, this has been loaded into the practice platform as practice exam one. And we're starting with part C of question one here. So I'm in question one, the case study question. I'm just going to open up my briefing notes so that I can copy and paste the requirement into here. And the requirement comes in this partner's email. And the question that I'm looking at is part C here. So as always, copy and paste the question into my briefing notes so I can use it to set up my answer plan. So I've got to use the information in exhibit six and do a couple of things. Firstly, I need to evaluate the audit strategy uh, and I'll also need to, there's an and there look, and so I'm going to have a separate part of my answer plan, discuss any implications for the group audit. I'm just thinking immediately, evaluate the audit strategy. Um, so an ev evaluation is going to have both positives and it's going to have negatives. And it's absolutely going to have a conclusion. An evaluation needs to argue both sides and come to a decision. Okay. And that is, and, and I also need to discuss any implications for the group audit. So that's going to mean um, anything extra that I'm going to have to do as the group auditor. This is 10 marks in total, so I'm looking for 10 points. Okay, lovely. So I've got an answer plan set up. And it's directing me to exhibit six. If you're working with the paper version of this, they change the exhibit numbers, it's exhibit five if you're working with the paper version. But hopefully that's not too confusing. So let's open up. Actually, before we open that exhibit, I always like to see if there's anything in the preamble that's going to be helpful. So here's the preamble. 
It's July 2005. I'm a manager in the internal audit, in the audit department, responsible for the Eagle Group audit. The financial year end is the 31st of August. Okay, that could be relevant, maybe. I don't quite know where yet, but let's get it in here just as a little note. So it's the year end is August 20, 2005, 2015, whatever that is, 2025. Uh, your firm is appointed to audit the parent and all of its subsidiaries, with the exception of Lynx, a newly acquired subsidiary in a foreign country. Okay, so it's a newly acquired subsidiary and it's based in a foreign country. Uh, and it is a local firm of auditors who are doing the work. That's Vulture Associates. I'm not quite sure what of that is going to be relevant to my answer, but it's definitely good background context, isn't it? It's relevant to me, to, to, to planning my answer. So I might not use all of that, but um, I'm already thinking, well, it might have a different year end. Um, it's a foreign country to, to the parents, so that could cause all issues with the audit strategy. Um, it's a foreign country, it could be different rules, newly acquired, we haven't got experience of, of it, or of working with this local firm. That's all bubbling over in my mind. Let's get to the detailed exhibit then. So two points below are an extract from the audit strategy. Other sections of the audit strategy, including risk assessment, audit risk assessment, have been reviewed by the group audit team and are considered to be satisfactory. Okay, so that's saying don't make general points. You're only going to get marks for talking about these things down here. So general things aren't going to score marks. Links is projected to be loss making this year. And the team is confident that the sufficient procedures on going concern have been planned for. Okay, let's just add that into here as our little note. It's loss making. Okay, they're going to place. So the first thing is around controls effectiveness. So we will place reliance on internal controls, which will reduce the amount of substantive testing which needs to be performed. Um, OK, so out of that first, I'm going, they're doing some controls and some substantive testing. That's decent. So I'm going to put that as a positive. It's more efficient to do that. This is justified on the grounds that in the previous year's audit, controls were tested and found to be highly effective. Hmm. Now issue there isn't it we can't say that the, the, the controls were working well last year but they're not necessarily working well this year so that's a negative isn't it they should be testing them this year so they might not be operating effectively anymore oh and actually another point around that um it, so controls have two parts don't they the design of the control and how they're operating so they might not be working anymore or it might be that there could have been changes in the business that require new controls. You know, they're now having to report, so they're now owned by a different a different company. There might be a change in personnel. There, there could be all sorts of different things. There are changes that have happened at this business. So the controls might no longer be designed properly because the business might have changed. So then we're told we don't plan to retest the controls as according to management, there have been no changes in systems or the control environment during the year. OK, now that's a worry, isn't it? They're just relying on management representations here that there's no need to change the controls. So that worries me that they are overly relying on management representations. Um, the fact that there's been no changes in systems or the control environment, that doesn't stack up, does it, with the change in ownership? Um, and the control environment, um, well, they're loss making, aren't they? We're told that up here. That was up here, look. Um, and so maybe that's given an incentive to overstate results to um, to perhaps make the performance look a bit better to so that they don't appear so loss making. Um, and around the control environment, it's definitely changed because there's a change in, in ownership. OK, I've now used that point about them being loss making, so I'm going to delete it from my little notes at the top. OK, then on to the internal audit then. Um, so Lynx has offered the services of its internal audit team to help perform audit procedures. Hmm. So this is being offered by the company rather than um, rather than us deciding we want to use it. Just let that bubble over for a minute. But the fact that there is an internal audit team, it makes sense to use them for efficiency. So that's a positive. Um, the fact that they exist is good for the um, the control environment. Uh, we're planning to use the internal auditors to complete the audit work in respect of trade receivables as they have performed work on this area during the year. 
Hmm, there's a bit of an issue with that. Um, they might have not have um, they might not have done the work to the standard uh, that we would have expected. Uh, they might not have tested in the same way that we may have done. Uh, they might lack competence. They might lack ob objectivity. Um, and they're inherently biased, aren't they? That objectivity point, because they're employed by the firm. Um, okay, then on to, it's more efficient for them to perform and conclude on the relevant audit procedures, including receivable CERC and evaluating the allowance for trade receivables. Well, the allowance for trade receivables is a subjective balance. Um, that certainly shouldn't be, we shouldn't be relying on internal audit for that. We should be doing our own work. And actually, I'm coming back to another point here. They've already completed this work on receivables. Um, now, they've got a self-review threat there, haven't they? Um, they might not want to, um, they might not want to highlight any weak work that they have pre prepared uh, because it will reflect badly on them. Okay, my conclusion then on this audit strategy um, having, I've got a couple of positives around it, which are basically efficiency, um, but they shouldn't be, they need to do more controls testing. They need to test them this year. Um, and um, they shouldn't be just relying on internal audit. They should be doing most of their own work. Um, they should only be looking at internal audits work as supporting evidence. So the audit strategy, I think is weak here. Okay, so I'll flesh out that conclusion when I write up my answer. So I've, I've kind of got this evaluating the strategy bit, but what I haven't got yet is any implications for the group audit. So what do I need to be doing? Uh, well, I'll, around the controls, I'm going to need to insist that they should be, um, they should be obtaining evidence. And on the internal audit, uh, I'm gonna need to assess um, how much I can rely on their work by looking at things like how objective they are um, and thinking about how competent they are. Are the internal auditors qualified, um, experienced? Um, is their work properly planned and, um, and, and reviewed? Now, just going back to my plan, um, have, I haven't really used the fact that they're newly acquired. Well, I have to say it's acquired during the year. That's a change in the control environment. So I have used that. Um, the fact that it's a change in year end, um, maybe I can get that um, in the design of the, the control environment. Um, so, And the fact that it's a foreign country and a local firm of auditors, maybe that's... Um, that's going to impact how easy it is for me to oversee the audit. And so maybe that's an implication uh, for my um, for my performance of the group audit. That might be worth a mark. It might not be, um, but I'm, I'm, just kind of, I'm going to keep it short. So it could score me credit if I need it. Lovely. So we've now got an answer plan. Let's write it up. So at first I've got the positives, my strengths. Um, so I've said they're doing a, a they're, they're using controls and substantive as an approach. Um, so they're responding, they're reflecting their audit approach um, based on how good the controls are. This makes for a more efficient audit. Um, and again, they're making use of the internal audit department, which is allowable under the ISAs um, for a more efficient audit. And we said it's good that the internal audit department exists in the first place. That's good for the um, control environment. OK, so these strengths, they followed a controls plus a substantive approach. It's weird. It seems to be playing OK on my screen. Just give, give me a second and I'll see if I can play it in a different format.
Um, I'm going to try a, a different share. Hopefully, this is going to be better. It's efficient to flex the amount of substantive testing based on the effectiveness of controls. Or efficient audit. Um, and again, they're making use of the internal audit department, which is allowable under the ISAs um, for a more efficient audit. And we said it's good that the internal audit department exists in the first place. That's good for the um, control environment. OK, so these strengths, they follow the controls plus a substantive approach. It's efficient to flex the amount of substantive testing based on the effectiveness of controls. Internal audit. They are allowed to make use of internal audit as an efficiency saving, but the external auditor cannot over rely on their work. The fact that internal audit exists is a positive indicator for the control environment. It acts as a deterrent for controls to be overridden. OK, weaknesses then. Um, so we said the controls were tested last year, but they might not be working properly. There have been some changes in the business, like its ownership and its year end date. Let's get that in there. Um, and the design of the controls may no longer be effective. Let's write that up. So we said the controls were tested last year. They may no longer be operating effectively. The lack of testing means this would not be picked up. Conclusion that the controls are fine may be inappropriate, meaning that more substantive testing should be performed. Changes at the business, the ownership, year end date may have changed to August X5 means that the design of the controls may no longer be appropriate. They may no longer be fit for purpose. Um, we are reliant, so next point, we're reliant on management's assessment of controls. They've told us um, that the controls are fine and we've just accepted it. This is quite worrying. We shouldn't have accepted this without doing our own testing. Um, and we've said that the um, the systems may have changed because of the change in ownership. I've kind of got that up here, but we'll, no, no harm in using it slightly differently here. So let's write that one up. OK, so the reliance on management's assessment of controls. The auditor should perform their own testing, not one, own testing of the controls rather than overly relying on management representations. Systems may have changed due to the change in ownership. Likely there will be different controls in place that should be tested. So next up, well, using the fact that they're loss making, um, it means there could have been override of controls to cover up further losses. And that means we should therefore have tested it to pick that up um, and therefore and, and perhaps done more substantive testing. So the fact the company is loss making, the controls might have been overridden to cover up further losses. Without testing the controls, this would not be picked up. The current reduced amount of substantive testing may not be sufficient to identify issues. That's a detection risk problem. This point here on the control environment having changed, um, I've already got that point there, so I'm not going to write it again. So on to the internal audit work then. Um, so we're relying on internal audits work um, on receivables, but their work has a different emphasis um, to the external auditors um, that's not being done for the same purpose. So it might not be appropriate to use their work. Um, and they've got inherent bias because they work at the business. If they uncover a problem, it could put their job at risk, um, particularly if the company goes under, they're loss making. Um, and so um, it's, it's inappropriate uh, to overly rely on their work. So the internal audit work is performed with a different aim or an emphasis to external audit work. Internal audit may not have gathered sufficient evidence to allow the external auditors to con conclude over receivables. Internal audit are inherently biased as a self-interest threat. They may be re reluctant to identify or highlight significant issues, particularly if they impact going concern, which is a problem because the company is loss making, as it could put their job at risk. So our next point is that the allowance for receivables is subjective. 
um, and um, we as a um, external auditor we should be doing our own work because we are less biased so the allowance for receivables is a subjective judgment management may be biased under providing to perform to boost performance an internal audit may lack the competence slash independence to challenge management robustly the external auditor should perform their own testing here god my typing is dreadful isn't it okay and our last point on internal audit is um, they've already done a load of this work um, they've got a self-review threat if they're performing further testing uh, because they won't want to highlight errors that reflect badly on them so internal audit have already performed test work over receivables a self-review threat exists if they perform further work here e.g receivable circularization they may be reluctant to highlight issues that should have been picked up in their original testing as it would reflect badly on them to do so okay um so my conclusion is um that the audit strategy is weak here they need to test their own controls and don't overly rely on internal audit okay so the audit strategy is weak flawed the planned procedures won't obtain sufficient evidence over controls and they're planning to overly rely on internal audit they may report an inappropriate audit opinion to the group auditor. Okay, onto my last bit then, which is implications for the group audit. So with the controls, we said that they should be uh, testing the design of the controls and their operating effectiveness. So with the controls, they should communicate with the component auditor and insist that they test the design slash operating effectiveness of controls um, with the internal audit um, we should assess the reliance on their work um, whether it's appropriate to rely on them at all how objective are they how competent are they is their work properly planned and reviewed okay so with internal audit i want to assess whether reliance can be placed on any of their work assess how objective they are e.g. do they report to the audit committee or to an executive director how competent are they are they qualified is their work properly planned and reviewed having made this assessment direct the component auditor as to whether it is acceptable to rely on any of the internal audit work okay my last point there about it being a foreign firm and these are sort of wider points i'm looking at this and thinking do i need to write any more content for 10 marks i've got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten oh, i've got loads of points in here i don't need to write anything on that um there's no point in deleting it because it could score me half a mark maybe probably won't i tell you it will score me nothing if i delete it could score me something if i leave it there so i'm just going to leave it but not waste any more time lovely done for the write-up of this part of the question so on to our next question then which is question three part b using my navigator go to question three and i start by opening my word processor so that i can do my planning and requirement b and let's do the old copy and paste so using exhibit two comment on the quality of the planning and performance of the audit of Watson Co discussing the quality control and other professional issues raised hmm, do I want to break that apart into separate parts uh, quality control and other professional issues here yeah, I think it's possibly worthwhile breaking it apart okay then looking at the original scenario is there anything of interest in here I'm the audit manager which orders a range or does a range of audit and other services um, I'm currently involved in two clients da, da, da. nothing particularly interested in here interesting in here so let's get the information in exhibit two so what we'll do is read through the scenario and as we pick out something we'll put it in our answer plan so one of our colleagues at Janssen & Co has been taken ill at short notice. Well, that's just one of those things. I've been temporarily assigned as the manager, which is an, on an IT consultancy company, which is listed on a second tier investment market. 
Okay, so let's get the fact that they're listed in here. That's a general point. Um, I'm going to use that somewhere in my answer, if not in several places. But, but why have they told me that unless I'm supposed to use it? The final audit is approaching completion. You're in the process of reviewing the audit working papers. The draft financial statements recognise PBT of 54.2 million and assets of 23.1 million. Now, why are they telling me that? Hopefully you're thinking it already as well. Yes, materiality. So I'm going to use those figures to do materiality calculations as I go through the answer. The audit supervisor, who is a part qualified chartered accountant, has sent you an email from which the following extract is taken. Hmm. Why are they telling me that they are part qualified as an audit supervisor? Is that relevant? Well, why are they telling me that if it's not relevant? Uh, part qualified, that's normal, isn't it? For a part qualified accountant to be having the senior role on an audit. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. They're listed. So maybe we should have a more experienced auditor on there. So other professional issues? So the fact they're part qualified means they're going to lack experience. We've got higher detection risk because they might not pick up things um, that they should have done because they lack experience. And the fact that the client is listed, there's greater public interest. We should have had a more experienced senior. OK, it's great to have you on board. I was beginning to worry that there'll be no manager review of our working papers prior to the final audit clearance meeting next week. Oh, so there's been no review happening and the final audit meeting is next week um, that's a worry because there's now not much time to resolve any issues okay so it's late to be doing this first review we might not have identified any issues because there hasn't been any review there might be lots of issues because the guy is part qualified who's running this audit and we've got less time to resolve them um, ahead of the final audit clearance meeting the assistant and myself have done our best, but we only saw Rodney on the first day of the audit about a month ago, when I think he was already feeling unwell. Who's Rodney again? Oh yeah, Rodney is the um, the manager who was assigned to this audit. So we only saw him on the first day of the audit about a month ago. We had a short briefing meeting with him when he told us, if in doubt, follow last year's working papers. That's not great, is it? What we should be doing at the start of a new of an audit or before, certainly before the start of the audit, is having a briefing meeting with them so that the audit juniors have a chance to understand the client, to ask any questions uh, so that they are more likely to detect issues during the audit. So the briefing meeting was on day one of the audit. It should have been done earlier to give the juniors a chance to ask questions so they can understand the client better, so they're more likely to spot issues and therefore lower detection risk. Um, is that quality control or is it another professional issue? I'm going to go, actually, that's another professional issue. The joy of the word processor. I can. The joy of the word processor, I can just copy and paste it. Lovely. Um, if in doubt, follow last year's working papers. Um, that is poor practice because things might have changed. Um, if we just do the same audit that we did last year, well, that might have been appropriate for the risk profile of the business at that point, but it might not be appropriate now because the business might have changed. So just following last year's working papers, um, that might not be appropriate because the company's systems might have changed, the risk profile of the business might have changed, which would mean that the test procedures are inappropriate. And also, they're a bit too predictable. If the client knows exactly what we're doing because we're doing precisely what we did last year, they might be able to hide things from us. Right, next in the scenario, one issue I want to check with you is that Watson has introduced a cash settled share based payment scheme by granting its directors share appreciation rights for the first time this year. Um, oh, OK, so that is it, it, that, that's adding weight to the fact we can't just follow last year's file. Let's add that in. This was not identified at planning as a high risk area. Hmm, that's a worry for me. Um, this should be a high risk area. They're doing it for the first time and it's complicated. So let's get that in quality control. So they weren't identified as high risk. This is inappropriate because these things are complicated, complicated accounting, and it's the first time they're doing it. Um, there's a higher risk of error. Then 
The SARS were granted on the 1st of May, at which date they obtained an evaluation of the rights by an external firm of valuers. I filed a copy of the valuation report and looked up the valuers online and found a very professional looking website which confirms that they know what they are doing. Now, is that enough to just look at their website? They can have a slick website, but they could be, well, lacking in uh, qualifications. They could be um, they could be connected to the firm in some way. They could be a related party of some sort. So we need to assess their um, competence by looking at their um, their qualifications. And we also need to um, assess their independence, which we won't be able to do through looking at the website. So the website check isn't going to give me comfort that they're qualified. It isn't going to tell me whether they're experienced and it isn't going to tell me whether they're objective. It will just tell me whether they can build a good website. So I'd need to do separate testing over these things. The cost of the scheme based on this valuation is appropriately recognised over a three year vesting period and a straight line expense of 195 grand has been recognised in the SPL. OK, um, so oh, a number that means I can calculate materiality. So it's 0.84% of assets. So it's 0.35% of PBT. So I've gone for PBT um, because it's an expense in the SPL, straight line expense. Um, and um, yeah, so because it's impacting profit, it's most appropriate to do it versus profits, isn't it? Um, so that is not material by size. Although, um, is it material by nature? Um, this is a directors, this is a transaction with directors, a related party. Um, it's, and it, we should be disclosing director pay. Um, so it's material by nature. Oh, it's telling me there's a corresponding equity reserve on the SFP. So it could be relevant to do this calculation versus assets as well. Let's see if it's relevant by uh, uh, material by assets. So it's 0.84% of assets. So it's not material by size there either. Threshold for assets is 1%, isn't it? So it tells me the amount seems immaterial. I can't see the need to propose any amendments to the financial statements in relation to either the amounts recognised or the disclosures made in the notes to the financial statements. Um, so it is material by nature, so we should be disclosing fully. That's an inappropriate conclusion. Now, it's so I'm, I'm certain that the disclosure should be disclosed. Um, there shouldn't be any amendments to the financial statements. That's giving me a hint that there should be some amendments. So what amendments should be made? What have they done wrong in the accounting for this then? Um, oh, it tells me that they did the valuation on the 1st of May. Um, and, well, that is not the year-end date. The year-end date uh, is the 30th of April. Um, so this valuation is out of date. They should be updating the, the valuation of these rights. There's other more technical accounting points that we should we could be getting in here, but I'm keen to keep this answer simple. So I'm just going to leave it at that. OK, so have I got enough in here for 10 marks? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight points. Extra mark normally for materiality calculations, isn't it? So I'm well on my way to a, 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 a full mark answer here. Some of these I could develop to be worth more than one mark as well with a good explanation. OK, let's write it up. Okay, I'm going to delete these little bits because I've used them in my plan already. So the quality control issues. The first manager review was one week before the final clearance meeting. It should have been done much earlier than that. So we could have identified issues and resolved them. Um, the fact that the auditor, the audit senior is only part qualified means there's more likely to have been errors that should have been picked up. Um, there's less time to resolve these issues. So let's write up that point. OK, so the first manager review happened just one week before the final clearance meeting. This is too late. The manager review should have happened earlier. Issues with the performance of the audit, e.g. incorrectly concluding that SARS are immaterial, should have been picked up earlier. This would allow more time for additional audit procedures to be performed to reduce audit risk. And adding to this point, 
The fact the senior is part qualified means they're more likely to have made errors as they lack qualifications and experience. It becomes even more important that earlier management review takes place as there is more likely to have been problems, higher detection risk. Okay, um, next point we've got in here is about the SARS having been identified as low risk or not high risk. Uh, we think that's an inappropriate conclusion. They're complicated. It's the first time management have done it. There's more of a risk that they've made errors. So the SARS were not identified as high risk. High risk. This seems inappropriate due to the complex accounting required and it being the first time that management have issued SARS. Both increase the risk of error. The auditor should have identified this as high risk and performed more procedures to reduce detection risk slash audit risk. Can I add anything more to this? Well, it could be because the manager review didn't happen early enough. OK, so it could be because the manager review happened too late. This next point about the website check. Oh, yeah, this was of the value, wasn't it? Um, we are not through doing this. We're checking whether they can create a good website, not whether they are qualified, experienced, or are objective of the client. Um, so we might inappropriately rely on the valuation report um, when we shouldn't. So website check of the value is insufficient evidence. It does not prove that they are qualified. We should obtain qualification certificates, experienced. We should obtain references or objective from the client. We should assess their independence. Are they a related party? The valuation report may be unreliable and an inappropriate conclusion of the valuation of the SARS may have been made. This next bit is talking about how big a deal it is, how big an issue it is. Um, we concluded that um, it was immaterial, didn't we? Uh, well, the, sorry, the audit senior concluded it's immaterial, but we know it's material by nature, it's direct to pay, it's a related party transaction. So it should be fully disclosed and it may not have been. So the SARS cost of 195 grand, calculations, it's not material by size. However, the pay is material by nature as a related party transaction. An inappropriate conclusion has been made about the cost being immaterial. Details of the scheme should be fully disclosed in the accounts, in a note to the accounts, and the scenario suggests they have not been. And our other point, uh, the valuation is one year out of date. It was done in May X4. Uh, it should be updated at the year end because the number might have changed. So the valuation is one year out of date. It should have been updated at year end as the share price may have changed. The SARS cost may be misstated and the current audit evidence would not show this. On to the other professional issues then. So we've used a part qualified audit senior who lacks experience. It increases detection risk, the risk that they miss something when doing the audit. Um, it's a listed client where there's more public interest um, we should have used a more experienced slash qualified senior and we should have given them more support. So the part qualified senior may lack competence and experience as they're not qualified. This increases detection risk as they may lack the knowledge to identify issues that arise during the audit, e.g. the correct accounting for SARS. It's a listed client with greater public interest in the results and more complex rules about what must be disclosed. A more experienced slash qualified senior should have been assigned to improve audit quality slash reduce audit risk. Okay, our next point. The briefing meeting happened on the first day of the audit. It should have happened much earlier to allow there to be more opportunity for the juniors to ask questions so that they more fully understand the client and reduce detection risk as a result. So the briefing meeting was held on day one of the audit. This should have been held earlier to allow juniors to ask questions, research the client and gain a fuller understanding of the client's business. The lack of preparation increases detection risk as the juniors are more likely to overlook issues due to their lack of client knowledge. Okay, and our last point is they were told to follow last year's working papers. That might not be appropriate. Systems could have changed. But an example we've got is that they've got these share options that have been raised for the first time. 
the risk profile of the business might have changed and so our current procedures might be inappropriate, might not gather enough evidence to support the audit opinion. And separate point, we're a bit too predictable if we're doing exactly what we did last year. Uh, management might be able to hide things from us if they know where we're going to look. So the audit team were directed to follow last year's working papers. The client systems may have changed since last year. There'll be no prior to follow, prior file to follow for the SARS as, I, as issued for the first time. The audit juniors would not have anything to guide their work in these areas. Risks faced by the business may be different this year. Even if last year's audit work gained sufficient evidence to support the opinion, the test may not be sufficient this year. It may be that more or different substantive tests are needed. The part qualified senior may lack the experience to identify this. And that separate point, the procedures may be too predictable if simply performing the same tests as last year. Management may be able to hide misstatements or fraud as they know the procedures that the auditor will perform. Detection risk is increased. Excellent, and we are done with this answer. Um, okay, I, I realised there were some technical issues with playing that video. Um, I, I, I think it must be the internet my end. Um, when I was playing the first video, it seemed to be absolutely fine, uh, but it's now kind of... <laughs> I don't know, everyone's up in the UK. and I don't know if bandwidth has got worse or, or what. It seems a bit strange to me. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, share a link to that video uh, with Joanne, who can share it with you. Um, and she can email it out to you after the session so you can watch that second video again um, if, you've, if you would like to. Um, I've also, um, you can see in the chat panel um, that one of my links wasn't working. Um, and here is the correct link. I'm putting it in the chat panel. Thank you. I think it was Luna um, who posted this. Um, that th this is the correct um, link to register um, for the uh, for for the ACCA session. Okay, uh, back into my slides. Okay, uh, so final message. Uh, so uh, we're just coming up to the end of our session now. Um, and what you've seen me doing there in that second video, I appreciate the quality wasn't brilliant. But what you saw me doing there with those uh, share appreciation rights is there were difficult technical marks to be had around the correct accounting for a cash settled um, equity plan. Um, but that was difficult. Those are technical marks. And I didn't bother with them, didn't try and earn them. I went for the more simple marks. Um, and that's my final message to you. Um, I want you to see the ACCA exam, the AAA exam, as being like a fruit tree, like this one you're seeing on the screen here. And if you were going to pick some apples from this fruit tree, you could walk around and look at what apples down here. There are apples low down here that would be really easy for you to collect, to eat. Or... There are apples up the top here. They're still just apples, but they'd be much harder for you to get to. You'd have to climb all the way up the tree to get there, um, and you might fall. It's dangerous. Um, the technical marks in AAA are these apples up the top here. These are the hard marks to get. Don't bother. You don't need them. You can pass this exam very comfortably by walking around the apple tree and taking the low-hanging fruit. The danger of going for the difficult technical marks is you spend a long time explaining yourself and you run out of time. And that means that you miss out on some of the easier to collect marks, the lower hanging apples, and it harms your chances of passing. You can comfortably pass AAA by just picking up the easy marks. And that's my final message to you. Okay, um, I appreciate we've come up to, I mean, time has worked pretty well. Um, this, this is the end of our planned time together. Um, if anybody does have any questions, I'm very happy to stay on and answer any questions that you have. Um, 
Kexin, a uh, yes. So your um, if if something is highly material, then absolutely that is a more significant audit risk, and therefore should be prioritised. The best answers, right? So the the prize winning answers will start with the biggest audit risks and then work their way down. Um, but there's no marks for it. It's just something that the the best students do. Um, I wouldn't worry about it. If you start off with weak ones and go strong ones and whatever, you still get the marks. So. Yes, pick out the more significant ones out of the scenario because there'll be more marks for them, um, but it's it's not necessary for you to kind of rejig your answer. That's Kexin. Um, Farina, in things like that are fine um, it's in question two and three. In question one, in the case study question where there is a professional skills mark, um, abbreviating can cost you one of those professional skills marks. Um, uh, for me, I just abbreviate SPOSFP, I would abbreviate, but things like internal audit, um, IA, I might do internal audit the first time in brackets IA. Esther, how do you know about the exposure drafts? You have to read the technical articles on the ACCA's website. They have said they will only examine you on um, things like exposure drafts that they have flagged as a technical article. So read have have a read of them they're up on the acca's website i'm also going to be discussing them in my podcast next week so if you subscribe to that you will get my chat on them thanks esther do we have any other questions oh okay mohammed additional information and audit procedures um so audit procedures um, I'm saying um, what the test is. So inspect title deeds. So the test is an action and, and a source. So inspect title deeds. And I am explaining why. Um, and that would be to confirm rights and obligations that I actually own the asset. That's an audit procedure. Um, additional information would be <laughs> it's very similar. Um, the additional information would be I'd want to get a copy of the title deeds, um, but I don't need to explain it in as much detail as I do with an audit procedure. But there's a lot of overlap. If you imagine a Venn diagram, additional information is like this, um, and then your audit procedure is a little bit bigger. It encapsulates the additional information, but there's a lot of overlap between those two questions. Thanks, Mohammed. Does anyone have any other questions? Please put them in the chat panel if you do. Um, Chi Hong, um, there is, yes, there is a recording for the um, ethics session. Um, I'm hopeful, I'm not, I think this works. This is, uh, I'm just going to, Double check that this is the correct link. Uh, okay, so um, hold on. Okay, for the session that covered ethics, um, this is the correct link. Um, and it will take you through to a registration page for the previous recording I did for ACCA. Um, and that, that, so this is the correct page for it to take you through to. Um, and this, so this session has already happened. And what this will do is give you access to the recording of that session. No worries, Chi Hong. Uh, Luna, you're very welcome. Um, it could do neural. Um, what they tend to do much more normally is give you the audit opinion paragraph and other extracts from the um, audit report and ask you to critically evaluate them. So they would have been done badly and you have to say why. So it is possible they ask you to do that, but they haven't done it in the past. Um, so I, it's much more likely they give you it and ask you what's wrong with it rather than saying you write it.
Thanks, Ethan. You're very welcome. Stay safe yourself. Um, WW, um, ratios stuff, generally it's capped at four marks for those little calculations. So and they tend to be half a mark per simple calculation. So something like a percentage change, half a mark. Um, something more involved, like a full analytical procedure might be one mark, generally four marks maximum. So maybe do five or six and leave it at that. Uh, I, what's PAP, Nick? We've got all the evidence similar to PAP. Ah, can you write audit evidence similar to a principal audit procedure? Yeah, absolutely. So audit evidence and audit procedures, I mean, the, the, the evidence is the, um, the evidence is the, uh, the title deed, the thing that you're actually looking at, the market research report, and that's the evidence. And the procedure is inspecting the, um, the market research report to confirm the uh, forecast growth rates. Um, so the, the evidence and procedures are, again, linked, but the procedure is bigger. The procedure uses the evidence, if you like. You're very welcome. OK, I'll just stay for another 30 seconds or so in case anyone's got any other questions. Uh, Misa, you're very welcome. Um, thank you for all of your engagement. And actually, I'd, I'll take that this chance to thank everybody for attending um, and for getting involved in the session so much. You've made it really interactive, which has been great. Uh, yes, CY, absolutely. A good audit procedure should have three things. It should have an action like vouch, confirm, um, inspect, that sort of thing. It should have a source document. Um, so something like a title deed, and it should have a reason, an explanation as to why this works, what you're doing it for. So um, we'll confirm outstanding balances with uh, receivables directly uh, to confirm the existence and valuation of receivables. You're very welcome, Juan. Thanks, Sarah. Have a great day. Good luck. I hope that you will feel the uh, best of luck, best of luck for the exam. Thank you, everybody.